asking Lord that none will go empty handed in Jesus name Amen. challenge our hearts Amen. put passion and fire inside everyone in Jesus name Amen. those who are sleeping wake them up those who are lethargic put something in every life will run with the gospel in Jesus name I will pray that this pure gospel that you have given us will preserve it Amen. will give it to the next generation Amen. and the people that hear us that come to the knowledge of the Lord in the fullness of his provision in Jesus name Amen. well thank you because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray Amen. you'll give me good amen before you sit down Thank you. God bless you. We're looking at Colossians chapter 4. And I'm reading here from verse 12. Colossians chapter 4. And we're looking at verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that she may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God as we come to the leaders meeting today I will think about a ministry and the place we hold and the purpose we have and the reason why God has called us into the ministry it's wonderful to see those who have gone before us and to see how they labored and the understanding they urge that the Lord has called me. He has called me to minister to these people. And here is the reason he called me. And here is what I'm going to achieve. Look at that verse again. Epaphras was one of you. He didn't have to go to a foreign land to get theology. He didn't have to go to any other fellowship to get understanding or to be grounded right there as he was in a Colosseum. He heard the word of God that everybody heard. How then was he singled out to become a minister? A faithful minister, a fervent minister, a fruitful minister. He took in the word. He knew that this word is coming for me in particular. And from a member, he became a minister. From a child of God, he became a servant of God. That's why he says, a paraphrase is one of you he grew up with you he lived with you he listened to the same thing that you have listened to but he singled out himself he got himself out of the crowd and he said this word is going to do something in my heart and the lord is going to use me to impart the lives of other people to look at this a servant of christ he became a servant of god right there from the pew he led the pew and he came to the pulpit. You see the people that come to the church, they crawl in, they crawl out. They come to the service. It doesn't, have, it doesn't make them to have any vision, any goal, any desire that I'm going to be a preacher. I'm going to be a servant of God. I'm going to be a faithful, fervent, fruitful preacher of the gospel. But this man, he came out of the pew and he came to the pulpit, a servant of Christ. I believe something is rising up in you. I said something is rising up in you. You will preach. I know you are preaching already. You will preach more. You will preach with fire and power with conviction and consecration and then we'll be able to talk about you like a paraphrase and it says look at this he salutes you always laboring you know there are people that do the work of the lord they do it now then they drop it they move forward then they come back they stand up then they sit down and they have uh, never heard about this in the bible they take vacation from uh, the preaching of the word of god they take holiday from the preaching of the word of god but you know epaphras always laboring is laboring in preaching is laboring in prayers is laboring in counseling is laboring in evangelism always laboring and 
then it says is laboring fervently for you in prayers look at this that ye may stand tell me the next word there perfect that she may stand perfect and complete in all the will of god and as you come to the ministry as you become a minister and you say the lord has called me and i'm ministering to this group of people that local church or that district church or that group over there or that region over there or that stage over there or whatever section of people you're ministering to it says this it but first what a good example what a good pattern what a good model it says he was laboring always laboring fervently he wasn't tired and then it says so that the people he was laboring on will be perfect and they'll be complete in all the will of God. We're looking tonight on the passion of a faithful minister. The passion of a faithful minister. You can say the zeal of a faithful minister. And you can say the desire and the, the fire burning within a faithful minister. The purpose of a faithful minister. God has called me. It's called me for something. And here is what it's called me for. And I'm going to achieve. You'll be an achiever. Uh, look at verse 13 there. It says in verse 13, For I bear him record that he has a great, tell me, a great zeal for you. You know, there are people who are not zealous. They're just like wishy washy. They are lukewarm. They are here and there. They are on a plateau. They are like, uh, you know, they, they, they fear going up higher. They fear being on fire for God. They fear being hot for the gospel. They fear being passionate. They will call me fanatical. They will say I'm eccentric. They will say I'm taking this thing too seriously. They will say, I'm so heavenly minded, I'm not earthly good. They will say, I'm too serious with religion, and I don't know anything here on earth. They are afraid of serving God with all their strength, all their soul, all their mind, with everything they've got. They are afraid of loving God too much. Look at those people on the football field. When they kick uh, that scene uh, that has air inside, they call ball, and then they'll be shouting and screaming, and they lose their heads. Some of them lose their lives. Look at those people on the football field as they kick, you know, as they do that. And then in the Olympics, they give all their hearts. Some of them fade while doing what they're doing, and they're not afraid to be fanatical for the things of the world. Look at those people in nightclubs, the people that beat all those drums and blow all those trumpets and all that and when they do that all through the night they don't care they are being fanatical and look at the people that have anything on hand that they say this is what i'm going to do they do it with pungency and they do it fervency and they do not care for your comment whatever because they are zealous for what they are doing it's all will come to the kingdom of god i don't want to be too serious I hope you'll change tonight. I said you'll change tonight. I don't want to be fanatical. You see those fanatical people in other religions? You see how fanatical they become? And they give their very life for what they believe. But it's only the Christians. I don't want to go too far. I don't want to, you know, be too hot about this. I don't want to be too passionate about But you see, this Epaphras, he had zeal. And then it says, for I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you and for them that are in tell me the word there now tell me out loud in Laodicea I say that for a purpose I'll show you now look at verse 15 verse 15 salute the brethren which are in tell me again in Laodicea second time look at verse 16 and when this epistle is read among you cause it to be read also in the church of the 
Laodiceans three times. You know what? The church of Laodicea, they were on fire. They were wonderful. They believed the word of God at that time. Because if there was anything wrong with the church in Laodicea, Paul the apostle will point it out. Because he said, say unto Archippus, in verse 17, it says, tell him to take heed and to the ministry which thou was received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. If anything was wrong with Lord this year, he would have said so. But he didn't pass any bad comment, any negative comment. They were all right. But you know what? Something happened to that church in Laodicea. At the time of Paul the Apostle, they were all right. They believed the Lord. They served the Lord. They were faithful. They were fervent. They were fruitful. But then something happened. At the time, you are going to now write to the church of the Lord. This is, look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen and the faithful and the true witness and the beginning the beginning of the creation of god i know thy works thou this say that thou art neither tell me cold nor hot i would that what that what cold or hot so then because thou art tell me lukewarm they have become lukewarm they have become lukewarm they were not lukewarm at the time of paul the apostle they were as fervent, as faithful, as fruitful as the church in Colossae because their ministers at that time they were like the ministers of the church at Colossae, like Epaphras. But eventually, those ministers of uh, the Laodicean church, although they were serious to start with, zealous to start with passionate to start with outgoing to start with committed to start with consecrated to start with the little by little they began to say looks like we're too serious what's you hot headed we're fanatical looks like we're taking this thing now too far and they began to cheap a little out a little out a little out when you drop a little now you drop a little now you drop a little at that time little drops of water make tell me a mighty ocean eventually they dropped everything by the time john was in the isle of patmos they become so lukewarm that jesus had to say i know that works you're neither cold nor hot you are not standing for what he used to stand for when Paul the apostle was there and therefore he said I'll spill you out of my mouth that's why the Lord is telling us if we love this church that's why the Lord is telling us if we want the church to remain like the church at Colossae and we want the church to remain in the fervency and the faithfulness of the life of the believer you know what you're going to do you're going to maintain the same spirit and the same heart and the same fervency and the same zeal as Epaphras. That's why the Lord is calling us today to the passion of a faithful minister. We're coming back to Colossians and I'm reading from chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 7. Colossians chapter 1. We're looking at verse 7. It says, As ye have also learnt of Epaphras at their fellow servant. As you have learned, the church at Colossae, the reason they remained at the level of their calling and at the level of their fervency, and they were keeping the faith, is because Epaphras, Epaphras was a fervent man. He was a faithful man. He was a zealous man. He was a passionate man. As you have also learned of Epaphras, a dear fellow servant, who is for you, tell me, tell me out loud a faithful minister of christ this was a faithful minister of christ before paul the apostle could call anybody faithful that man was faithful to the gospel 
faithful to the preaching of the gospel faithful to the practice of the gospel and faithful to the principle of the gospel faithful to the minutest details we have in the gospel that's why paul the apostle said you know him you know him is a faithful minister in christ and is laboring fervently among you so that you'll stand perfect stand perfect and complete in all the will of god i pray that that same heart that same desire that same passion that same faithfulness and that same zeal that the Epaphras had will have it in jesus name uh, but you know it's something for you to have it today and then for you to have it tomorrow and to have it next week and next month and next year until you see jesus face to face and that thing will not die in your soul i say it will not die in your soul but you know there are people they are up there today they are down there tomorrow they're keeping the standard today and then tomorrow they cannot keep the standard again because they do not have the spirit that conquers you know temptation will come you have to conquer trials will come you have to conquer suggestions will come you have to conquer you will see other ministers in other places the way they are doing their thing and the way they are carrying on things and if you're not careful you want to you go down the drain with them and say after all we're all ministers look at look at him he's a minister look at her she's a minister how is he that i'm the only zealous one i pray your fire will keep burning somebody there i said your fire will keep burning you will you will not become lukewarm you see Colosse did not copy laodicea did not say look at laodicea laodicea now is you know topsy topy and all that because of that let me follow them no you are not going to follow them you are going to keep the standard you lift it high you maintain it high and this thing will not die in your hand in jesus name uh, you see you see what a purpose had in mind he wanted to have the people perfect perfect I pray that God will help you to keep the word of God so that the people who listen to you, they will aim at perfection. Are, are you there? Yeah. I said they will aim at perfection. Yeah. And you will not excuse imperfection in your own life or in the life of the people you are ministering to. The, uh, the passion of a faithful minister. I, I'm looking at this from three perspectives. Number one, the precept of a higher call the precept of a higher call he gives us a precept he gives us a command and the command relates with perfection that's why he paraphrased the faithful minister that's why he said i'm going to lift this standard up i'm going to maintain this high standard because of the precept to that higher call the precept of a higher call number two is the is the provision in his holy covenant the provision in his holy covenant is giving us a provision and that provision also is about a perfection it's not just giving us the command and you say go and try it out see if you can do that no we cannot do that in our strength but in the strength of the lord the provision of god himself and the provision of calvary and it will give us that perfection in jesus name number three the perfection of a heavenly character the perfection of a heavenly character we're coming to number one the precept of a higher call let's go back to the old testament and see where it all started after the lord had called abraham he also said he ought to be perfect. We're looking at uh, Genesis chapter 17. And I'm reading from verse 1. Genesis chapter 17. Uh, and we're looking at it from verse 1. It says, And when Abraham was uh, 90 years old, nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me. Tell me the rest and be thou perfect that's the precept that's the commandment that's the call that he gave him is the call to higher life 
it's a call to a higher level it's a call to a higher experience that he, than he had before i'm sure you know already that uh, this, this abraham was already saved in our language of the new testament he was born again how do you say that and look at genesis chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 6 genesis chapter 15 verse 6 and he believed in the lord and he counted each to him for righteousness that's that's it that's salvation he believed in the lord and he counted it to him for righteousness not by works that we have done but by his grace he called us believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved and then as he became saved he was righteous but you see the lord now called him to another experience and the lord is calling everyone that you will not remain where you are come up higher and come to a higher level it says and when abram was 90 years old and nine the lord appeared to abram and said unto him i am the almighty god walk before me and be thou perfect uh, when we learn something from here god cannot command will not command that which he knows to be impossible how do you command somebody to do something that you know he cannot do it's like telling a bird to swim it's like telling a fish to fly god will not do that god created the fish to swim and so he can command swim and he created the bird to fly and so he can command fly he created us in his image and he created us in his likeness and he is holy he wants us to be holy he is perfect he wants us to be perfect he is pure he wants us to be pure be ye holy for i am holy says the lord he gives us the nature and then he has sent jesus christ here on earth to demonstrate and to show to us what part perfection is all about and then he says that's my son hear ye him and then the son said be ye perfect as tell me your heavenly father is perfect god cannot command will not command that which is impossible and for anyone to do whatsoever he commands he gives us grace to do it and when he called abraham and when he called the seed of abraham and when he calls all the sons of abraham by faith and he says walk ye before me and be thou perfect is commanding us to do what he knows we can do if we have the might to if we pray for his grace to if we lean upon all the help is able to offer unto us if we read his word aright he calls us to perfection and we're going to live in that perfection in jesus name the higher call to walk before him and be perfect calls us to sanctification a higher experience a definite experience of purity of heart of transparent holiness of freedom from inward sin as well as outward sin and it is not just to hear about it or just to know it in the head he wants us to have it as an experience when he called the children of israel come to deuteronomy now deuteronomy chapter 18 I'm reading now from verse 13. You remember that they came out of the land of Egypt. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And when they came under the covering of that blood, the cleansing of that blood, they were born again in New Testament language. They were saved in New Testament language. Their sins were totally taken away and they came out of the land of pollution. They came out of the land of Egypt. Look at this now. Deuteronomy chapter, uh, chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 13. Are you there? It says, Thou shalt be, tell me the word, perfect with the Lord thy God. It says, You're walking with God. To, this is not Abraham now. These are the children of Israel. There are men there, there are women there, married people there, single people there. They were going on their way to the land of Canaan. And then God told them, He said, God is with you, and you are with God. You are saved, you are redeemed. You are called out of the land of uh, idolatry. Now I want you to be perfect with the Lord your God. It's the same higher call that He gave unto them. We're looking at First Kings chapter 8. First Kings chapter 8, they've settled now in the land of Canaan. 
and now they are, they are already having kings and all that and look at the word in first kings chapter 8 and we're looking at verse 61 in verse 61 it tells us let your heart therefore tell me be perfect and it says with the lord our god and we're not just talking about perfection you know in a human definition perfection according to human proposals perfection according to you know our low standard of definition it says be perfect of the lord your god and that's what he told the king right there in a first chronicles i'm reading from chapter 28 from chronicles chapter 28 that's why epaphras a faithful minister that's why i was passionate about this that's why i was zealous about this that's why it was laboring fervently for those colossian people that they will follow the lord in perfection first chronicles chapter 28 and i'm reading from verse 9 and it says and thou solomon my son know that know thou the god of thy father and serve him with what with a perfect touch serve him with a perfect touch you know if, if you come from genesis you come to deuteronomy then you come to first kings and you come to chronicles and it's challenging us to the higher call and he's saying you will not excuse sin in any form that's a little thing don't excuse it a little poison in a glass of water that, that already spoils that water and a little poison in a plate of food that already spoils that thing you know say that that's a little sin that's a little sin uh, that's a little fault and that's a little sin over no it calls us to perfection if you excuse sin in your life if you excuse a little sin in your life how do you preach to your people what do you tell your people because they can see you that you know you know he is always excusing that if you ask him about this say well nobody is perfect uh -uh, nobody is perfect what are you preaching then and what are you telling people if you are not encouraging them and laboring fervently that they'll be perfect in the will of god what's your ministry we must have the zeal and the passion that we want that perfection within us and we want it in the lives of other people too you, it will happen i said it will happen you will not remain the same as you are today you will grow up you will climb up you'll fly up in jesus name and then you'll be able to tell other people you say the grace of god is available as the lord has given me the grace he'll give you the grace and then you run this race you encourage the people you tell them here is what the word of god says and you stand by that word of god in jesus name second chronicles second chronicles i'm reading from chapter 19 second chronicles chapter 19 and i'm reading here from verse 6 second chronicles chapter 19 and we're reading from verse 6 it says in verse 6 and he said unto the judges the counselors he said unto the judges the leaders he said unto the judges the teachers he says take heed what she do you see if you if you're a leader you have to take care of your action take heed what you do if you're a teacher of the word of god you know you're a teacher all the time you're not just a leader on tuesday you're not just a leader on monday you're not just a leader on sunday you're a leader all the time if you're a man you're a man all the time and if you're a teacher you're a teacher all the time you're a pastor you're a pastor all the time it's not only when you climb the pulpit and you come to talk to us and come to preach to us that you're a pastor you're a pastor all the time you will take heed what you do look at that verse 6 again it says and it said unto the judges the teachers the leaders the counselors take heed what you do for ye judge not for man but for the lord have you ever thought about that you preach not for man but for god you teach not for man but for god and the ministry you minister not for man but for god and then he goes on to say for the lord who is with you in the judgment look at verse 9 now in verse 9 and he charged them saying this shall you do in the fear of the lord faithfully and tell me the rest 
with a perfect heart. I'm wondering where are these people that say nobody can be perfect? Everybody is mentioning the perfection. And the people that are telling us and they're saying you're serving God and you're preaching for God, you're praying and then you're leading the people for God and it says you will do this with a perfect heart. And I pray that all this that the Lord is giving to us, it will not slip away from us in Jesus' name. We're looking at some 101, some 101. And I'm reading here from verse 6, some 101. And we're reading from verse 6, 101, verse 6. It says in verse 6, mine, I shall be upon the faithful of the land. It says, I'm looking for somebody to do a special duty. My eyes will be upon the faithful in the land. I'm looking for somebody for a special ministry. My mind, my heart will be upon the faithful in the land. I'm looking for somebody to go out there and reach out to those perishing souls. It says, my heart will be, my eyes will shall be upon the faithful in the land. Look at this. And they that they may dwell with me he that walketh in what uh, not people who are wobbling not people who are you know they are wobbling they are you know here they are there they are staggering they're not sure of where they stand they're not sure of what they believe they're not sure of what to stand for they're not sure what to pass across to other people it says the people that will be with him and walk for him it says there'll be people who walk in a perfect way he shall serve me i pray god will make you qualified I said God will make you qualified. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Uh, this is uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount that the Lord gave to his own disciples at the very beginning of his ministry. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. We're going to read it together. One, two, three, go. You know, if Jesus, if Jesus was teaching the truth, this is the truth. If Jesus was the very Son of God, look at what he tells us. How could he tell us to do what he knows to be impossible? Perfection. Perfection. And he says, be therefore perfect. Be therefore. The word therefore means, you hear all that? I've been telling you from Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 and verse 4 and, you know the humility and the peace and the righteousness and the purity of heart and the desire for heaven then it is at the end of this chapter it says be ye therefore perfect if you oppose that if you are telling yourself I know I'm not perfect I know I'm not perfect I know I'm not perfect you are contradicting Jesus Christ you cannot say I love Jesus I don't love his word I love Jesus. I don't love his sermon. I love Jesus. I don't love his message. He was too strict. He went too far because he told the people, be ye therefore perfect. I will be perfect. I said, I will be perfect. Every imperfection, you're not going to love your imperfection. You're not going to coddle your imperfection. You're not going to excuse your imperfection. You're not going to cover up your imperfection. You're not going to tolerate your imperfection. You come to the cross. You come to Calvary, the blood of the Lamb to wash you and to cleanse you. And you say, I love Jesus. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. And this is what He calls me for. He calls me to the top of the mountain. He says, It's not just your pardon. It's not just that you are forgiven given he wants you to come to higher ground and he says be ye therefore perfect as your father which is in heaven is perfect you wake up in the morning you say lord i remember the precept i remember your commandment i remember what you are calling me to i remember you want me to go to higher ground as i'm going to the office today as i'm going to college today as i'm going to teach in the school today as i'm going to my market today help me everything that happens my attitude my character everything I do help me to carry out this be ye therefore perfect and when you go on the street and you see what you shouldn't you remember I'll be perfect now and then you hear what you shouldn't hear you cannot control that because they are playing whatever they are playing and the sound is coming but you say turn my ears away from that turn my eyes away from that turn my mind away from that because I remember the precept of Jesus Christ for me and by the grace of God my mind is there I'm going 
going to do it you will do it in jesus name in luke chapter luke chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 40 luke chapter 6 and we're looking at verse at verse 40 here luke chapter 6 we're looking at uh, verse 40 in verse 40 it says the disciple is not above his master but everyone everyone tell me everyone tell, i said shout out everyone everyone that is perfect shall be as his master that, that is the perfection he's talking about all i need to do is if jesus were in this situation what will he do do that that's perfection if jesus were in this circumstance what will he say say that that's perfection if jesus were called to this challenge how will he face this challenge face that challenge just like jesus that's perfection the disciple that will live like the master the higher call he has given us and the higher call is bringing us to the precept that is laid before us is this precept to the higher call that will be as perfect as the heavenly father if you say well i have not seen the heavenly father here is jesus we have the record of his life in matthew in mark in luke and john and he says do as he did act as he acted talk as he talked and fulfill the will of god as he did and just say not my will but thine be done and have a surrendered life a submissive life and when you are like that as the perfection is talking about look at that verse 40 again it says the disciple is not above his master but everyone i'll be among that everyone I said I'll be among that everyone, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. And that's why he prayed for us, you know, in John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Look at the prayer he prayed for us. I'm reading verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. These are born again people. These are saved people. These are ransom people. These are people that have genuine experience of salvation. He says, I'm praying for them. Look at verse 20. He says, Neither pray I for these alone, for these 12 disciples alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. He prayed for us, those who are going to be saved. Uh, according to the writings of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then all the other apostles, we've read all those epistles. Now we're born again. He says, I'm praying for them. What prayer is he praying for us? Look at this in verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. That's the prayer. He prayed for us to be sanctified. And the result of that sanctification, look at verse 23 i in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one sanctification a perfect heart a perfect attitude a perfect disposition a, a, a hand that is centered on the lord a perfect love loving the lord with all your heart all your soul all your mind and hating everything that deviates from the perfection and the words of the lord that you love his word you love his standard you love his principle you love his calling and you love the work he has called you to he says sanctify them and when you sanctify them you make them perfect in one that's the precept of a higher call i come to point number two the provision in his holy covenant the provision in his holy covenant you remember he called abraham and when he called abraham he said they walk before me and be thou perfect look at what follows in genesis chapter 17 genesis chapter 17 here we're reading i'm going to back up to verse one so you see the connection and when abram was 90 years old and nine the lord appeared to abram and said unto him i am the almighty god walk before me and be thou perfect and i will make my covenant between me and thee. you see that the call to perfection came with a covenant and it is the holy covenant and what's the covenant if you read this chapter 
Ebenezer is the covenant of circumcision. The covenant of circumcision. It tells us, uh, look at this in the verse, uh, I'm reading from verse uh, 2 now. It says, and I'll make my covenant between me and thee, and one will multiply thee exceedingly. Uh, come to verse uh, four, 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name be called Abraham, but thy name shall be Abraham. For as a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and the king shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And then he goes on to now give him the right of circumcision and he says uh, look at uh, verse, uh, verse 11 and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it says and it shall be a token a sign a symbol of the covenant between me and you circumcision it came with this covenant and with the call to this higher ground the holy covenant and look at that uh, circumcision now the real circumcision God wanted to have in the hearts and the lives of those descendants of Abraham. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And I'm reading here from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we're reading here from verse 6. It tells us in verse 6, And the Lord thy God, what will he do? Tell me out loud. He himself, the Almighty God, the Lord thy God, will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. Which means it was not to finish with the first generation of the children of Israel. It was to go on offering after of offspring and then seed after seed to their generation and the heart of thy seed. And what's the result of that circumcision? Look at this. To love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. That's that's sanctification when your heart is circumcised not by man when your heart is circumcised not by yourself when the almighty god himself when he circumcises your heart he takes away the depravity he takes away the carnality he takes away the self-centeredness he takes away the thing that is in there that still wants to go your way that wants to do your own thing your own way and he makes you totally submissive unto the teaching of the lord because he says is the lord thy god it will circumcise your heart you know there are people i'm sanctified i'm sanctified it's just story it just word of mouth because we cannot see that entire love we cannot see that entire submission we cannot see that total yieldedness to the dictates of god to the demand of god to the directives of the lord but when he does it it makes you to love him with all your heart all your soul and all your mind we're looking at romans chapter 2 romans chapter 2 and i'm reading here from verse 28 romans chapter 2 we're reading from verse 28 the covenant the holy covenant and the, the the promise of that and the provision of that in romans chapter 2 verse 28 it says for he is not a jew it sent a descendant of abraham which is one outwardly neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh then it says but he is a jew which is one inwardly you see that is something of the spirit is something of the heart and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. You see, that's the position. That's what he wants for you, for me, for us. It will be done. In Colossians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. Colossians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 11. See, talking about the circumcision. It tells us in chapter 2 of Colossians verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That is without the hands of man in putting off the body, in putting off the very root, in putting off the very nucleus, in putting off the very kernel, in putting off the entirety, the completeness, the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision 
of Christ. You see, that's what the covenant brought when God called Abraham and he called him to this holy covenant. And the holy covenant is to bring the circumcision in the heart, circumcision in the mind, circumcision in the spirit. And then it gets reached that body of sin, Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, we're looking at verse 6. Romans chapter 6, we're looking at verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, you see that? The very nucleus of sin, and the very root of sin, and the very kernel of sin, and the very thing that produces all those other things that is hidden within there, the carnality. It says that the body of sin might be covered up. What does he do? May be destroyed. And then he says that henceforth he should not serve sin. We are looking at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 20. In verse 20, look at what it says. It says, I am crucified with Christ. That's as Paul the Apostle. If you remember the life of Paul the Apostle, Paul the Apostle was a self willed man, a strong willed man, an iron constitution man. He was, he was wicked to the core. And when he went to those houses and took those women and those boys or girls that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, he had no sympathy at all. He was a man of a principle. And he really wanted to, single-handedly, he went everywhere. A strong mind that he had. But you know, that strong mind was broken. He met the Lord Jesus Christ. When you meet the Lord Jesus Christ, all that hard heart, all that stony heart, and all that strong will, everything is broken. And so he now tells us in this Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me if he did it for paul he can do it for me i said he can do it for me i said he can do it for me look I'm, I'm, i wasn't as tough as paul hard as paul as wicked as paul brutal as paul and if that man came to have a total turning around anything can happen by the grace of god it will take away that carnality. It will take away that self-centeredness. It will take away that strong will. And then you will become so submissive. You say, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life, the new life, the higher life, the holy life, the heavenly life, the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's made the provision. Now come and look at this in Hebrews chapter 13 Hebrews chapter 13 I'm reading from verse 20 Hebrews chapter 13 we're looking at verse 20 verse 21 it says now the God of peace which brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you watch tell me out loud I thought they said it was impossible but see, everywhere we read, you come to the Old Testament, perfect. You come to the New Testament, perfect. God is about to do something in your life. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will and to walk in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. That's how the provision comes. That's how that perfection comes. And that's how that cleansing will come. It says, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And here we're looking at verse 1. It says, have been there for these promises that live in love. It says, look at all the promises you have all the privileges we have look at the provision we have and it says having these promises then dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from some of the filthiness from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit what's the next word there perfecting holiness in the fear of god 
it will happen something higher will begin your life today something greater will begin today we're looking at point number three the perfection of a heavenly character we're pilgrims here on earth we're on, the, we're on our way to heaven and it is this heaven that is uppermost in our heart every time and because this is uppermost in our heart and this is what we're looking for that's why you want that perfection to be a reality the heavenly character coming into our lives and coming into a disposition and attitude and everything we're coming to some 119 some 119 and i'm reading from verse 1 Psalm 119, we're reading from verse 1. It tells us in verse 1, Blessed are the undefiled in the way. As we're going on the way to heaven, it says, Blessed are the undefiled who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and they that seek him with what part of their heart? Well, the whole heart, it says, They also do no iniquity that's the perfection there they do know iniquity then it goes on to say the walk in his ways how does that happen we're looking at some 130 some 130 and we're looking at verse 8 some 130 and we're looking at verse 8 and he shall redeem israel from and he shall redeem israel from and he shall redeem israel from all is iniquity this is the perfection there it doesn't just redeem us and then he leaves some you know a sprinkle of iniquity and some small iniquities and some carelessness and all that no he redeems us from all iniquity and you find uh, the, the replica of that in uh, titus chapter 2 new testament now titus chapter 2 and we're reading from verse uh, reading from verse 14 titus chapter 2 we're reading from verse 14 how he redeems us how he cleanses us how he purifies us to perfect us he says who gave himself for us that she might redeem us from how much of iniquity all iniquity and purify you see that and purify and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works that same thing the lord is still telling us he did it for other people before he's about to do it for us we're told in philippians chapter 3 philippians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 15 philippians chapter 3 verse 15 let us therefore as many as be perfect you see that paul the apostle he wasn't uh, saying well uh, we don't want to be proud what's the pride god saved me and say i'm saved God sanctified me. I said, I'm sanctified. God gave me grace. I said, praise the Lord. I have grace. I didn't say I manufactured it. I didn't say I produced it myself. I didn't say that. Look at what I have done. I said, look at what Christ has done. And look at what he has effected in me. And he's glorifying the Lord. And he's saying, let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. If he did it for them, he'll do it for us. We're looking at the first Thessalonians chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 10. First Thessalonians chapter 3. We're reading from verse 10. It says in verse 10, Night and day pray exceedingly that we might see your face and why what do you want to see their faces look at this in verse 10 and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith paul the apostle said thessalonians i've been praying and i've been desiring and i've been making plans i want to come to you what do you want to come to us to entertain us why do you want to come to us to pet us? Why do you want to come to us to say congratulations that you are even saved at all? Why do you want to come to us to come and comfort us and say, well, it doesn't matter what you do. Grace is always there and the grace will come. He says, no, I'm coming there to perfect whatever is lacking in your faith. He had the same spirit and the same mind as Epaphroditus had and as Epaphras had that they were laboring fervently so that they could bring perfection to the people of God. First of all, you are laboring fervently by the grace of God in prayer, you will be perfect. 
I said you'll be perfect. And then you take that. If God has done it for you, you go to tell other people. Yes, you tell them gently, but you tell them. You tell them faithfully. You tell them softly, but you are going to tell them. And you tell them pungently. You tell them so that they will not excuse their imperfection. And Paul, the apostle said, I'm coming to you. And I'm coming so that I can perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Look at verse 12. And the Lord make you you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men even as we do toward you then it says for the purpose of the end so that he may establish your hearts tell me unblameable in holiness that's perfection and it says before god not before man it says he will establish your blameable in holiness before god even our father at the coming of our lord jesus christ with all his says he will do it in our lives in jesus name in revelation chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 2 revelation chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 2 revelation chapter 3 we're reading from verse 2 here is the word of the lord as he tells us he said be watchful your minister be watchful your preacher be watchful your leader among the people of God, be watchful and strengthen those things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found, tell me, thy work perfect before God. Jesus said, I'm looking for perfection. I'm looking for perfection. The work of a pastor there, I'm looking for perfection. And the work of that minister there, I'm looking for perfection. And it says, be watchful and strengthen those things which are ready to die because I've been watching your life, I've been watching your ministry and I'm looking for that perfection. I've not found, it says, for I've not found thy work perfect before the Lord will perfect everything that concerns us. We're looking at First uh, Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 10. First Peter chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 10. It says in verse 10, but the God of all grace, it comes back now to the grace of God because whatever we are, we're saved is by grace, we're sanctified is by grace, we're purified is by grace, we're perfected is by grace, we're filled, energized, empowered is by grace, and we're given opportunity to minister is by grace. And it says, the God of all grace who has called us unto his eternal glory by jesus christ after that ye have suffered a while that's persecution he make you what's the next word there perfect establish strengthen and settle you he will do it for you uh, that is why you you want to uh, pray to the lord and say lord this perfection that jesus christ gave his life and gave his blood to provide for me lord do it for me and tonight it will do something in your life and then it will go on and then it will go from you to the congregation perfection is coming we're looking at Colossians chapter 1 verse 28 Colossians chapter 1 we're reading from verse 28 it says whom we preach you must preach warning every man you must want the people you're not you kind of uh, glossing over what people do and what people say how people live it says whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's why Epaphras was the way he was. That's why you want to pray. God will give you the same zeal of Epaphras, the same passion of Epaphras, and the same, the same outgoing passion that he had, he'll give us in Jesus' name. In chapter 4, verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you. Put your name here now mention your name who is one of us i said you are one of us you are not a stranger you are not somebody that came from outside there you are one of us you are drinking the same water we are drinking am i talking about you then 
eating the same spiritual food we're eating am i talking about you there and you believe the same thing we believe with every dot of an eye with every cross of a t and you say yes i'm one of the people of god and it says a paraphrase who is one of you a servant of christ saluteth you always laboring you will not be tired always laboring fervently for you in prayers that she may stand perfect and complete in all the will of god look up here for a moment if our church is going to be perfect it depends on us christ has done everything he will ever do he has given us the word of god he died for everyone on the cross of calvary the blood he shed on the cross of calvary is mighty and strong enough to purify everyone pardon everyone purify everyone and perfect everyone but you have to go and tell them and we have to demonstrate it to them that that blood has worked in our lives if the church is not perfect it's not the fault of christ it's not the fault of god it's not the fault of the holy spirit it's not the fault of uh, the bible it's not the fault of the leaders and the preachers who have gone before us it's our fault it's because we're not taking the word of sanctification the word of holiness the word of purity of heart and the message of perfection we're not taking it serious that's why our people can see that imperfection in us they see it in every area of our lives in the things we say the things we do how we handle the work of the lord how then are we going to encourage them it must start with us there it will start tonight i said it will start tonight every stronghold in our lives will be broken down and then the power of god will come down and crush everything that needs to be crushed and then we lay everything on the altar again and we say lord purify me lord perfect me and do this work in me and then you go here from the fire falls upon your soul upon the altar and then you go with the fire and the zeal and the passion and you go to the church and your minister perfection will begin here it will begin here tonight and then we carry to all the churches this church will be strong and this church will have standard and this church will maintain the perfection that god has given us in the experience of sanctification you will have it am i talking to somebody there why don't you rise up and say oh lord here are we today here am i today do it in me he will do it in you and then uh, you'll be able to carry it on to all the people this is you now this is you now this is you now it's you coming to them and saying lord do something in me do something in me all the careless talk all the careless attitude all the careless behavior all the things we're trying to excuse a little here a little there little drops of water make a mighty ocean that's why our lives are cold that's why our lives are lukewarm that's why our lives are not making an impact we must make impact let the fire burn to him lay everything upon the altar as a sacrifice of the lord and say lord here i am let the fire burn it will burn